Well, hello and, and welcome to Explore the Essentials Lesson 4. It's great that you can be with me today. Thanks very much for watching this video. Now, just a reminder, the last lesson we would have looked at, if you're watching this in the series, was Lesson 3, of course. And we thought there how the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, were given a rule by God. And what happened? They broke that rule. And God had told them there would be a consequence. You might remember that, a consequence if they, if they broke the rule. And they were put out of the garden where they enjoyed being with God. But, as we can see, God showed them grace. God showed them grace. They didn't instantly die as they were told they would. They were separated from God and eventually they would die. But you might remember God clothed them. And that's what that picture shows, that God gave them clothes of animal skins. Well, what happens is Adam and Eve, they had children and then their children had children, their children had children. And in the end, the world was populated to quite a large extent. Not like it is now, nothing like it is now, but there were a lot of people living on the earth. But there was a problem. Yeah, there was a problem. The verdict of God on the people was this, that they had sinned. They were sinning continually. Now, not everyone, I'm sure, was as bad as they could be, but sin, this doing wrong, marked the earth. If you look at the screen just now, you think, what is sin? Well, sin really is this. It's the missing the mark. It's like aiming for a target, if you like, seeking to aim at a target and missing it or falling short, you know, not getting to the right required standard or to slip off the way, to look to be on a path but to not keep on that path, to go off the path. And really sin is like that. We fall short of God's standards. We, we don't keep on the way that he has said. And God saw this sin and said there would be a consequence for it. Now, God was really patient and he waited years and years for people to turn to him. But instead of turning to him, really it got worse. And in the end, he said, here's the consequence. Now get ready. The consequence was this, that he would send a flood. There would be a global flood across the whole of this world. Not just a local flood in one place, but over everything over this world, a flood. Wow. But however, there was a man called Noah. And the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Now, grace means to, to give someone something that they don't deserve. Now, Noah was a good person in our estimation, but he wasn't perfect. But here's what God said to Noah, and this is the grace. He told Noah that there was going to be a worldwide flood, but he says, there is a way for people to be saved, a way for people to avoid the consequence of their wrongdoing. And God was going to provide that way. So God said there's a consequence of going wrong, doing wrong against me. But here's a way to be saved from that global flood. And what happens is he tells Noah to build a really large boat. Now, some of you might have heard this story. The boat was called an ark. And what happened is Noah was given the precise instructions how the ark was to be built. He was given the measurements and everything. God gave him the plans. And Noah started building this ark. He had three sons and they had uh, three wives, a wife each, and... They started building, building, building this ark. Now, no one 
had ever seen a flood before. No one had ever seen much rain before. And some people thought this was odd and stupid. But Noah believed God. Noah heard what God said and he believed it. That's what faith is. Trust in and what God has said. And he based his life upon it. He based his actions upon it. So Noah found grace. But, you know, Noah was a man who had trust in what God said. He believed it. Now, what happens is this. During the time that he is building the ark, he also does something else. He goes to the people and tells them that there's going to be a punishment, that God is going to punish their wrongdoing. And God will punish it by sending a flood. Really, Noah's just repeating what God has told him. And what happens? The people, now, God will never do that. Or they might have said, some might have said, I don't even believe there's a God. Or, well, no, I think we'll be okay. And some put it off, maybe for another time. But they, most of them just laughed, rejected, mocked Noah. In fact, as we'll see, a lot of them laughed, rejected and mocked Noah. Now, I'm sure that didn't stop Noah. Keep going out and telling the people, pleading with them that to avoid the punishment, they had to come into the ark when he said so. But he said, no, 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 no. They probably laughed. This ark's being built in a desert. We're miles from the sea. There's going to be no flood around here. Anyway, time moved on. And what happens is this. There was one day when God causes the animals to come to the ark. Two of each species, two of each kind, a male and a female, were to animals to go to the ark, two by two. And then into the ark came the people. How many people? Only eight. Yes, only eight people. After building this massive boat, this ark, and warning everyone of the punishment that would come, only eight go in. There's Noah and his wife, their three sons and their three wives. Only eight people go in. God had said that he would send a punishment that'd be consequence for the evil that people were doing. But most didn't believe. And you see the picture? Well, we don't know what Noah looked like and we don't know his emotions. But I think in that picture, it shows us Noah looking out and looking a bit sad. And he is sad because I think he looks and he knows what's going to happen. He knows the people haven't believed him and he's got a love for that people. Same as God has got a love for the people. That's why God provided that way of escape. However, they refused and they rejected that. And so Noah looked sad. And what happens is God actually shuts the door of the ark. Now, what we're going to do now is we're actually going to think about this ark. We're going to think about the ark. The Bible actually gives us some of the measurements of it. So we don't need to speculate. We don't need to imagine in many ways what it's like. We've got the big measurements. We've got its length, its height and its width. Read with me on the board, if you can, please. See that in red? The length of the ark was 300 cubits, its breadth 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. That was the ark's measurements. And you think, hang on, what's a cubit? Well, if you notice on that picture, it showed from the elbow to the top of the finger is roughly a cubit. How far do you think that is for me? From my elbow to the top of my finger. Well, 
have a guess. Let's measure. Okay, here we go. There's the tape measure, hit the floor. Top of my finger, whoa, got a hold of myself. And all the way down to here, just about there, here we go. And that is, see that? 19 inches, or if we're gonna go into metric, about 48 centimeters, thereabouts, 48 centimeters. So to make it easy for ourselves, let's call it half a meter. It's a little bit less, but half a meter, one half of a meter. Now we read that the arc was 300 cubits long. One cubit is one half of a meter. So how long was the arc roughly? So you've got 300 times one half. Well, I like to think half of 300, and that is 150, yes, 150 meters long. Look at the screen. Don't know if you've ever been on a big plane. A big plane that sort of takes people across the Atlantic. The arc is twice the length of that. So the arc was, was massive. Not a little, little boat, but a very big boat. And here's the thing. It wasn't built for speed. It actually wasn't going to really go anywhere because the whole earth was going to be covered with water. As long as it floated, as long as it was stable, that is all that mattered. And so this big boat was built. Here's another picture on the screen. Look at that. This is sort of someone if imagining what the ark looked like with the three stories in it and how all the animals might have fitted in. Scientists worked out, or have worked out, up to 70,000 animals could have fitted in the ark. Wow! The Bible doesn't say how many there were, but there was a lot of room in this ark. How did they put it together? Out of wood? Well, have a look at this video quickly, and that will show us something of how people think the ark was put together. They're using principles which they know were used later on in times by the Greeks. Have a look at this now. There we go. An ingenious construction method seen in ancient shipbuilding that used edge-jointed planking puts the BBC's faulty claims to rest. In this uh, exhibit of the Ark under construction, we're treating the planking as uh, exactly the same way as the Greeks did the planks. When, when Greeks built their ships, the large ships, they used to use multiple layers of planking. And they had this special trick where they had joints in between each plank. And you can see the joint here, they're, they're a tenon and they fit into a mortise in the adjacent plank. And that locks the two planks together. There's no way they can move. There's no way that they can break a seal and let the water in. This is a very advanced technique. In fact, it wasn't even seen at all in any of the ships built in the last few centuries in Europe and America. Um, we believe this method would allow the ship, the Noah's Ark, to be built without any problems at all with uh, movement of the planks and leaking. Uh, which did plague some very large wooden ships. Um, interestingly, wooden nails, called tree nails or trunnels, are actually a very successful way to join planks to, to the frame. The reason these work so well is because, first of all, they're a nice big diameter, so it doesn't dig into the wood. But what happens is, when water hits the wood, the wood expands, seals off the hole, and makes it an impossible to remove. Wow, so that was pretty interesting, wasn't it? You know, it was like wooden nails and the man said when those water hits the wood, it swells and those sort of wooden nails can't come out and how all the wood was locked together. Oh, that's pretty impressive. That's how they think Noah might have put the ark together. Anyway, back to the story. As God said, the flood came. 
the rains came down and in fact in some parts the earth opened up like sort of volcanic eruptions but water comes out. The whole shape or the geography of the world is changed with mountains coming up and valleys forming. There was this global flood and sadly, yes sadly, everyone outside who rejected or refused the offer of salvation to, to be rescued from this flood, well now it's too late. And now they did suffer the punishment, the consequences of what they had done wrong before God. And so there was this global flood. The rain come came for 40 days and for 40 nights. It was torrential. Like nothing we've seen, you know, sometimes we've seen some bad rain, haven't we? And we might have seen pictures of flood and maybe that gives us an, a little indication of what it was like. But this was all over the whole world and there was the sort of volcanic activity. 40 days and 40 nights, but that wasn't the end of it. No, Noah and his family were actually in the ark for one year. Yes, because... The whole world is flooded. Now, eventually what happens, the ark lands on a mount. And actually, the Bible does tell us the ark landed on Mount Ararat. That's in modern day Turkey, Syria type of area. And that was where the ark landed. And what happens is when it's around there, Noah lets out a raven. He lets out a raven and he sends it out. See if there's got anywhere it'll rest. But there is no rest. So Noah then sends out later a dove. And the dove goes around and comes back. There's nowhere for it to perch. So Noah waits seven days and then he sends out again. And as you can see, the dove comes back with a leaf, meaning there must be some trees somewhere, some bush, because the dove has come back with this sign that there is trees or there's bushes. And then seven days later again, Noah lets the dove out. And this time the dove does not return. And Noah now knows that there is resting place for that dove. And what happens after that is they come out of the ark. Wow! They've been a year in this ark. They come out, the animals come out. The, the geography of the world is quite different. But the very first thing they do is they worship God. They build a, what they call an altar and they worship God because they are so thankful that God has saved them and God has kept them safe all during this terrible time. They, they really realised that they weren't a whole lot different from the other people. The only difference was they trusted in what God said and trusted in his salvation and they were indeed saved from the awful consequences of that. So they trusted. Now what happens is that God speaks to Noah and in the sky, if you look at the picture, he puts a rainbow. I'm sure many of us have seen rainbows, haven't we? You know, we, we, we see them often after times of rain. We look into the sky, sometimes really bright, sometimes not so bright, faint rainbows there, but we see them. And God said, this is a reminder of a promise. God made a promise to Noah and do you know that promise comes to us as well. Here's the promise that God said. I will never flood the world globally again. Wow. God made a promise and it's what we call an unconditional promise. I'll tell you about that in a moment. God said I will never flood the world again. Now that is unconditional. God didn't say, if you do this, 
then I will not flood the world again. He didn't say, if you don't do that, then I will never flood the world again. He just said, I will never flood the world globally again. That was a promise that he made, unconditional, didn't depend on what anyone else did. So there's two types of promises in the Bible, conditional and unconditional. There are really two types of promises that we can make. Let me tell you one. Let me think. Ah, yes. When I was young, my mum and dad might say to me, if you're good, then you'll get to stay up late tonight to watch TV. So that was a promise. I would get to stay up late to watch TV if I was good. So there was a condition attached to it. If I was going to stay up late and watch TV, I had to do my part. That was called a condition. However, if that had said to me, you can stay up late tonight and watch TV, that would be no condition. They just promised me. Well, that didn't often happen anyway, but that's, that, that would be a promise. That would be unconditional, nothing attached. I'm going to ask you to look at the screen and see if we can work out if these promises are conditional or unconditional. Here we go. Here's one. And think in your head because the answers will come up. Here is my covenant that I am making with you. The waters of a flood will never destroy all life again. A flood will never destroy the earth again. Now, a covenant is another word for promise. So God is saying, here is my promise that I am making with you. The waters of a flood will never destroy all life again. A flood will never destroy the earth again. Is that conditional or unconditional? And the answer is unconditional. It's an unconditional promise. God just promised he would do that. Let's have a look at the next one on the screen. But you must not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you do, you can be sure that you will die. Now we remember that from a lesson before, hopefully. God made a promise that they would die. Is that conditional or unconditional? The answer is conditional. If they did that, then they would die. So there was a condition attached to that. So it was conditional. Okay. Number three. Here we go. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So God makes a promise that you will be saved. But is it conditional or unconditional? Does it depend on something that I've got to do? The answer is yes. So it is a conditional promise. If you do this, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. So that's a conditional promise found in the Bible. OK, next one. A bit harder. Number four. Come to me, all who are tied and are carrying heavy loads. I will give you rest. So that's a promise from Jesus. I will give you rest. Is it conditional or unconditional? What do you think? Well, it is conditional. See, the condition is come to me. Jesus is saying, come to me, I will give you rest. So the condition to get rest is to come to Jesus. OK, last one. Number five. Here we go. If any of you need wisdom, ask God for it. He will give it to you. So there's a promise that God will give wisdom. Is it conditional or unconditional? Answer? Yeah, conditional. You have to ask for it. If you don't ask for it, you will not get it. So there's conditional and unconditional promises. They're a feature 
of our language and every language you know when promises are made sometimes there's a condition sometimes there's not so well done for doing that today now the bible shows us that noah's ark is a real historical event and there's a few similarities between noah's ark and jesus christ do you know the whole bible actually points to the person of jesus christ and Noah's Ark is no different. Look at the screen there. You'll see both are real and historical events. Noah's Ark was real, so the Bible shows it. And the Lord Jesus was real. He came in time. The second thing is this. Both are God's provision to escape his judgment. Do you remember? The people had to come to the ark. God said, I've provided a way of escape. I've provided a way where you can be saved. But they had to go to the ark, didn't they? And in the same way, the Bible says that God's great provision for people to be saved from consequences of doing wrong is Jesus Christ. So there's another comparison. And there's one more onto the screen. God says they are the way of escape. They are the only way. OK, so Christianity teaches, the Bible teaches that there was only one way to escape the global flood. Going into that ark that God provided. And there's only one way to avoid any consequences, bad consequences for wrongdoing. And God, again, has provided the way through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can see comparisons there. Now what we're going to do is go to the worksheet. If you look at your worksheet there's this uh, 10 questions on there and there's 10 little pictures. There they are on the screen. Now what you've got to do is look at those questions and seek to answer them by drawing a line from the question to the answer. Now, if you can't get the number one, start at number two or three and work it like that. And take your time. If you want, you can pause the video now. Pause the video. And then when you restart, I'll give the answers. OK. OK, so hopefully uh, you've completed the, the worksheet. Let's go quickly through the answers. They'll all appear on the screen. Here we go then. So why did God destroy all of creation? And your line should go to evil, the evil that people had done. Number two, who did God ask to build the large boat? That's the ark. And that of course was Noah and it was 600 years old. Yeah, people lived a long time before the flood. Now, number three, how many people were on the ark? That's it, eight. So it's that little group of eight people there. There was Noah, his wife, their three sons and their three wives. Number four, how many of each animal went into the ark? And there you go, your line should be up to those giraffes, those two giraffes there. Okay, two by two, two of each kind of animal. And then once they come out, they populate the world again. Number five is, how long did it rain for? Now, how long did it rain for? 40 days and 40 nights. Next one, how long were they in the ark for? And that of course was one year or thereabouts, one year in the ark. Wow, that seems a long time, doesn't it? Next question. What did Noah send out to check for land? Well, he did send a raven, but the picture is to the dove. And there's the dove with the twig in its mouth. OK, next question. Number eight. When the water went away, where did the ark rest? And it rested on Mount Ararat. There we go, Mount Ararat. Number nine. What did Noah and his family do when they stepped 
off the ark. Yep, they built an altar and they worshipped God. They gave God thanks for what he had done. They gave a sacrifice, actually. Um, just really thankful to God. And the last question here is, what sign did God give Noah that he would never flood the earth again? And that, of course, was a rainbow. So there we go. How did you get on with that on the worksheet? Now, I know there's a word search on the worksheet. No need to do that yet. We're going to do a little revision. We're going to do true or false. Today, we've got seven questions. It's keep your own score. Get ready. True or false. You can do the thumbs up. You can do the thumbs down. You can shout out. You can do whatever you like. True or false. Let's get ready. See if you can get seven out of seven. Might be a tricky one or two questions here. Let's see. Number one is this. God told Noah to build an ark. Noah made the plans for the ark and then built it. Is that true or false? The answer is false. Yes. God did tell Noah to build an ark. Noah did build it, but God made the plans for the ark. They were God's plans for the ark. Number two. Here we go. God was pleased with how mankind was living. God was pleased with how mankind was living. True or false? The answer, of course, is yeah, false. He was not pleased at all. And there was going to be consequences for that. Right. Number three, God said he would punish sin, but he would provide a way of escape. Answer? True. Yeah, God provides a way of escape. Marvellous, isn't it? Doesn't have to, but he does. So there we go. Number three. Number four, Noah told the people that God would judge their sin, but there was a way to be saved. Is that true or false? And the answer is true. Yeah, Noah told the people of a way to be saved. Let's go to number five. Number five, most of the people believed Noah and went into the ark. Most of them believed and went into the ark. Well, sadly, no, they didn't. False. Sadly, they didn't. Number six. Listen carefully. The rain fell for nearly one year. True or false? The answer is false. Now, they were in the ark for nearly one year, but the rain was just 40 days and 40 nights. Now, the last question, number seven, is this. God promised he would never again send a worldwide flood. True or false? Answer. True. And that was an unconditional promise, remember. So there we go. The great Bible story of Noah and the ark. How God said there'd be consequence for wrongdoing. He was patient. He didn't punish for ages. He waited for people to turn. But even when he said he would punish, the Bible teaches he provided a way of escape. So thanks very much for listening. Now, on the worksheet, there is a word search. I'm not going to give the answer up afterwards, but you can do that. Have a look at the screen now. You'll see that what you have to do is for all those letters underneath the line, you select the letter before it in the alphabet. So if you look, the first word is done. O. Well, what's the letter before O in the alphabet? It's got it in the blue there for us. N. Then there's P. What's the letter before P? That's O. What's the letter before B? That's A. What's the letter before I? That's H. And that word spells Noah. So on the word on the worksheet, you can do the other ones there for yourself. There's not going to be the answer coming up. I just want to say thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time. Hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Goodbye from me. Take care. Bye.